discussing is uh, this chat GPT. Now there is a lot of questions uh, which are pretty much from technology side to societal side that should we have such technology for ourselves? Should India build a chat GPT for ourselves? So this is the body which should actively engage with this technical matter of this things. And uh, when when I was approached, I agreed, uh, knowing that some of my friends who are experts would want to come to this program. And they are the ones who are experts who are actually in the business of making this chat GPT and practicing. And hopefully we will learn from them. So what I'm hinting at is no questions to me. These are the guys who answer the questions. So what we thought is what we will do is uh, quickly uh, introduce uh, the program for the next two hours. We'll have three talks followed by a panel discussion. So what I would request all of you is to do the following, that as you listen to these talks, you try to formulate some questions. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, right? And we'll so, dig them up as the panel. So now, uh, I think it's important now. to just set the tone, uh, but I did not know what she will set the tone right. I was not prepared for that. Hence, I prepared a couple of slides to set the tone for this. So uh, I mean, uh, apologies if you've seen this slide, but this is one of my favorite slides I prepared. So if you go back 100, 100 years, you know, the interesting question the world was asking at that point, the conferences of the day, the scientific bodies of the day across the globe, were asking that industrial revolution is over. Now what next? Can machines think? Questions like this, right? And then the formulation came out, of course, it's a very complicated question. It, it, it ranges from, you know, spirituality to biology to mechanics, all kinds of things. I don't think we have made much progress then, but, but but this uh, Alan Turing's formulation that, you know, you can put aside these questions and make it a more predictive question. You know, so the idea is that suppose there's a room, uh, there are two rooms. In one room, there's a machine and another room, there is a human. I ask quest same questions to both the rooms. You, you do not know which room wh who is there. And from the answers, can you figure out, is there a human or is there a machine? This is called the Turing test. And if we say that they can, you cannot, then I will say that the machine can think. Of course, it's a very naivety, but this, this has been the defining character of modern day AI. That's what's called artificial intelligence, right? Uh, but, more, but maybe this is not the time to do that. So uh, some definitions. So first question, is, what is GPT and LLMs? At least the definition words. So apologies to the physicists and the electrical engineers here. Transformer, what you know, you have to say that is old, that is old, old world. No, no use. I'm joking. <laughs> so now, so now transformers are essentially, uh, I do not know why. Uh, maybe actually all these engineers actually glorify physicists and, you know, electrical engineers. So they would keep them transformers. But essentially it is, in the spirit of the day, it is like a, a deep neural network. What is a neural network? If we know, then you don't ask me, then I will give a two hour lecture. You don't want to hear now after lunch. So let's say deep neural networks is, so, that's called transformers. And now, so this architecture, when it is, so now neural networks is one of those machines which can learn from data. Now suppose you learn uh, these uh, transformers on a large variety of text corpus or image corpus. Maybe maybe all data in the internet. So pre-trained. And it has the ability to predict. And now what kind of prediction? So many of you do time series analysis. I'm sure there are a lot of experts here who know lots about time series. Autoregressive models. This is one way to shut up a thing. This is called generative pre-trained uh, transformers. Generative means I can generate a new thing. Right? And now what are LLMs? These are called large language models. So what is the large language model and what is the connection to this autoregressive things? Now if I say, after lunch, Chiru is looking for answer, obviously some of my friends will say coffee. And that's what we went and you got drenched. So, so this, this, is, this is the sense that Large language models or something like that. The moment you see a few phrases, you can be able to say what comes next. So the, the autoregressive nature, and hence there's the connection. So uh, so Chat GPT is uh, actually an instantiation of this. Uh, so the chat part is that now you can ask questions uh, to uh, uh, like you can pose questions to this model, and the model will answer something. So that is what the setup is, and that now now today instead of wasting more time. Here are some of the experts. Uh, I, I personally uh, are in awe in this, uh, their capabilities and they're actually leading, in my opinion, leading uh, the development 
and uh, uh, practice uh, uh, in the field today. So what we'll, we'll have is we have three talks as I said, the first one will be driven by our own colleague Professor Partho Talukdar. He's a professor in CDS and CSA department, but also he's uh, right now at Google Research India. Uh, the next talk would be by Professor Monojit, uh, Dr. Monojit Choudhury, who is a principal researcher in Microsoft Research uh, India. Uh, and then uh, the third talk would be given by Professor Vasudev Verma. He is in the CSE department in IIIT Hyderabad. He is also now doing a sabbatical in brain enterprises and uh, he is now the SVP of that company. So this, uh, these three speakers would take 20 minutes and maybe dwell on, on various aspects of this. Uh, uh, chat GPT, LLMs uh, uh, and uh, all concerns related to that. And then uh, lastly in the panel we will have one more uh, colleague, uh, Professor Soman Chakravarti who is here, uh, a recent inductee in our uh, Indian, Ac Indian Academy. So these four of them will weigh in as a panelist. And now, uh, so, uh, so now I thought this is a thing about, uh, we can ask the panel but maybe for later. So one can th think about, I think many of you are worried that in chat GPT, right? We can, it can generate fake news, things like that, right? So what are the uses and misuses of chat GPT? And, uh, and there are no better experts than uh, the panelists uh, who can tell us better. Though we would also like to dwell for, hear from them that is, should, for example, developing chat GPT for India. Is it feasible? Is it sustainable? Should we do it at all? Uh, there's other fear we're raising across societal minds is that would we eat up jobs? So do they open new job opportunities? I don't know any of these answers, maybe the experts will tell us, but without much ado, uh, so let me then invite Professor Patti Talukar. Okay, uh, so good afternoon everyone, thanks to you for having me here. Um, so like you know, I mean uh, large language models are very popular, I think like you know all of us probably like you know have played with it one way or the other. So in uh, this talk I I'm thinking of uh, giving like a quick overview of like you know what these like LLMs are about and uh, what's their relevance and what we should be doing about them in the Indian context, right? Uh, those two parts. So just to make sure we are all on the same page, uh, large language models are large uh, general purpose models uh, which can uh, be pre-trained and then subsequently uh, fine-tuned for specific tasks, right? So one way to think about it is maybe like, you know, I mean our uh, drawing analogy to our education. So maybe until like, you know, class 12, Right, so we kind of like learn general purpose things like you know, language, math, arithmetic and all that kind of stuff. And then subsequently when we go to university or like you know, pick up certain profession, then we uh, go deep dive into a particular area and learn more about that profession or about that subject, be it engineering, medicine. So you can think of this like you know, education until 12 as pre-training, general purpose learning about the world and then fine tuning is deep diving to that like you know, uh, subsequent stage. So, uh, so that's kind of like another you know, one way to think about is like you know learning general purpose and then becoming uh, specific, right? So uh, Chiru already talked about this. So like you know how we can do this kind of uh, pre-training or doing general purpose learning. Uh, so one uh, like a you know, dominant way that's uh, used uh, right now is through these auto completion methods, right? So uh, if you see, if I give you like a uh, sentence like the cat sat on, then I ask the model, this large language model, to predict what that next word is going to be, right? So if I gave you a uh, text uh, prefix like this, like the sat, uh, cat sat on, uh, what would you say? I mean, the colors are not very visible, but maybe you will say things like, you know, the, a, it, and after that maybe the mat or the couch, all of those other words are going to come, right? And for each one of them, there are also probabilities associated. So, um, so this is basically how you train and there are like a few other variants of how you could train these kind of models but, uh, but the key idea is that uh, these kind of like you know auto completion uh, tasks you can create directly from the unlabeled data. Like you know if you just have like a text corpus like a bunch of sentences that if you have then you can create any number of these kind of like you know, text prediction problems, right? But the benefit is that now you don't need uh, inputs from experts to train these kind of models. And if you have like a you know, large corpus, uh, especially for text models, uh, now you can do like, you know, create trillions of these kind of text prediction problems and then uh, train the uh, model. And the way it makes it scalable is that now if you have just large amounts of corpus, you can make these kind of prediction problems, right? And 
This combined with availability of large corpus, like you know, the entire web and then large compute has made kind of like a good intersection uh, to enable this kind of model training. And all throughout the talk, I will have these kind of like QR codes. If you want to follow up and learn more, you can scan and follow it up afterwards. Okay, and then uh, like, you know, I mean, just by doing these kind of somewhat simple looking text prediction or auto completion problems, uh, these models are able to learn a good, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, probably a model about the world and to have like, you know, very impressive performance. So uh, like, you know, they are able to explain jokes or do various kinds of like, you know, logical inference problems. So in all of these examples, what you see is that like, you know, things that's written in uh, black at the top, like, uh, like in a black ink, uh, that's kind of like given as input to the model and everything in blue is model predicted, right? So as you can see, uh, this is still like a text completion problem, right? So some input was given and the model was asked to predict everything else in an autoregressive manner, right? But in doing that, it also like you know, demonstrates some kind of like, you know, joke explanation capabilities, logical reasoning capabilities, just to give you uh, two examples. Uh, and not just restricted to natural language, like say, like, you know, English, Spanish, Hindi, and other languages. Uh, uh, it also, I mean, if you expose the models to like, you know, artificial or synthetic language, like say programming languages, then it also tends to pick up, like, you know, useful things from there. So in this case, uh, like, you know, the input that was given to the model was like, you know, could you write a function to check if a string is a palindrome? in JavaScript and also add line by line comments in Malayalam, right? So given this input, this is again in an autoregressive manner, token by token prediction from one model, which is the palm model in this case. And then for each one of those um, code snippets, it has also given comments in Malayalam, right? So again, uh, these are like no impressive things. All of this has happened through these kind of like no text prediction problems training on both natural language and code repositories, right? So um, the LLM work streams, like you know, how these kind of models are trained. First, lots of work goes into data preparation. Quality of the data is very important. Uh, uh, and so you spend like you know, a lot of time in curating and uh, like you know, selecting a subset of the data set. Lot of compute heavy lifting goes into this pre-training stage, right? So that, that auto prediction problems that I was talking about earlier. Now, once you have a pre-trained model, then you do fine tuning, maybe align that with human feedback. That's the next step. And then you do some sort of evaluation deployment. And these last two steps could kind of like, again, this contrast is not great here, but uh, like now these two could like now repeat again and again, right? Um, and a um, lot of the, uh, compute uh, kind of like you know uh, work the requirements that we kind of like you know uh, hear about like okay these many like you know uh, flops and all of that is needed so that goes in the uh, pre-training stage so this is in a very high level what these like you know, LLMs are about and how they are uh, trained so hopefully this gives you some grounding about like you know what these LLMs are about so um, what I will do is like you know, maybe just show one or two examples um, so there is a, uh, uh, so if you go to this URL, uh, uh, g.co slash pum. So there is a tool called uh, Maker Suite, uh, which is available. You can kind of like you know, sign up for it. And then uh, you can try out, I mean, yeah, without writing any code, just from your browser, you can basically like you know, interact with these kind of like you know, large language model. So I just want to just show you one or two examples. Um, so if you, for example, like, you know, my uh, son's 10th uh, birthday is coming up, like, you know, next uh, month. So if I want to ask things like, okay, help me plan a birthday party for a 10-year-old, then, like, you know, it's going to give me some sort of, like, you know, plans for that birthday. Or uh, there is, like, an you know, input-output examples you could give. For example, you could say that, hey, uh, you are a travel agent, you as in, like, you know, the large language model, right? So you are a travel agent, I'm going to give you a city, then you give me some description of that city just like you know any travel agent that you visit would tell you in like you know, two different voices one is kind of like a regular voice the other one is like an excited voice right so you just provide like you know this context some uh, examples so three examples in this case right and then I ask like okay for Mysore 
uh, now I'm going to kind of uh, uh, ask for like an output. So now this is the uh, output that we saw that's coming from an LLM, right? So when I ask for MySore, now it's giving me MySore. So now I don't have to write any code to even interact with these kind of models, right? And if you're interested, like, you know, you can always uh, take this output and then like you know, export into code and like, you know, if you want to keep on developing afterwards. Similarly, there are like not chat interfaces as well. Um, uh, so you say that like, hey, uh, you want to uh, like, you know, uh, talk like an uh, alien or, or I think this is in an imaginary world. So you say like, you know, you provide like a few examples of the order of like say three. And then you say like, imagine you are the size of an ant traveling to a sponge for cleaning dishes, then like, you know, what your life is going to be like, right? So then the model like, you know, impersonates like an ant walking through like a sponge and uh, like, you know, uh, now again, given this input and this prefix, now this auto regressive decoding is going to happen here, right? So that's what the output we see, right? And it's going to say things like, like, you know, walking through a sponge is like, uh, like, you know, it's like a mysterious world, uh, like, you know, lots of like mites crawling on the surface, things like that, right? So uh, this is just to give you some flavor of like, you know, how you could uh, interact with these kind of like, you know, models, uh, both uh, using like, you know, text completions, chat, and uh, like, you know, input output data pairs. Okay, so uh, hopefully that gives you some uh, flavor of what these models are about. So now the question is like, you know, what's the relevance for India, right? And what we should be doing in that case. So I want to uh, like, you know, start with a concrete example of a lady called uh, Sharmila, name chains for obvious reasons. So she's 45 years old, doesn't have any formal schooling. Uh, she speaks Santali and Assamese, like, you know, has a smartphone, uh, like, you know, uses YouTube, WhatsApp, and GPay, but GPay mostly, like, you know, through others, right? And we have, like, you know, millions and millions of Sharmilas, like, like Sharmila in our country. So the question is, how can LLMs help Sharmila and, like, the millions like her, right? So, um, Again, uh, just to like, you know, uh, drive in terms of some statistics. So these kind of models right now, like, you know, can serve very well English users, like you know, pretty much everyone in this room, but then only about 10% of our population of, of India uh, have like, you know, some knowledge of English, right? And then if you look at various statistics, we have like, you know, 850 million uh, internet users, and that's a growing number, thanks to like, you know, better connectivity, cheaper data, and uh, people who are coming into onto the online, like Sharmista for the first time, uh, for like Sharmila, uh, they overwhelmingly uh, want to engage with uh, the web and benefit from the web in a language of their choice, right? So the question is how we can serve uh, these users better. Now, when I think about LLMs for India, I kind of like not think about this yin and yang kind of situation, right? So if you leave things as is, then this like, you know, the digital divide that we talk about is just going to increase, right? So people who know a handful of languages, who are like, you know, well-educated, like, you know, these models in that current state is going to serve that population very well, right? But then what about the rest, right? Um, but then I also feel that like, you know, these are the best tools that we have in our repository to in fact shrink the digital divide, right? To make information and access to opportunities uh, uh, like, you know, more inclusive, but then that's not going to happen by default, right? So that's like, you know, conscious effort is going to be required. And uh, interestingly, that's where like, you know, lots of new research also needs to be done. So that's kind of like, you know, keeps me excited to work in this space that while you can do fundamental research, but then you also have like, you know, huge societal uh, impact possible. We all know that uh, in India, we are like, in you know, a very uh, hugely multilingual country we have 22 scheduled languages, 1,500 plus total languages, lots of scripts, lots of users. Uh, this is the like, no, distribution in terms of number of speakers for um, like, no, the, the 22 scheduled languages. We, uh, for Hindi, there are some like, you know, 400 million plus speakers, but then Hindi is not a monolithic language, right? So there are like you know, uh, 42, 40 plus uh, dialects and variants of Hindi. So in order to serve India well, we need to work with this level of diversity and uh, do well for these uh, representative languages, right? So, um, so if you want to like, you know, uh, make LLMs helpful for Sharmila and users like her, so uh, what do we need to do? So as I mentioned, if you remember those like, you know, work streams, so the pre-training 
uh, and innovation are two important buckets there. So for pre-training, we need uh, text corpus. So remember, like in all of these, like in you know, a model training is happening on autoregressive predictions on text corpus. So we need text corpus in these languages, right? But if you look at like Wikipedia as a representative example of like you know, how much corpus is there in various Indian, uh, Indic languages. So for English, there are six million plus articles. And then for uh, Hindi, I think that number is about like 160,000, right? If you go to like Odia, spoken by like you know, 10 million plus people, that number is about like 10,000 or so, right? So we have like a you know, severe skew in terms of data, uh, data availability and even for languages like Hindi, that number is not great. So we have to do something about this that either like you know, create more data for Wikipedia, like you know, Vasu uh, and his colleagues have been doing lots of interesting work on creating Wikipedia for Indian languages. So we need more efforts of that kind or develop new methods which are more data efficient that even with smaller amounts of this kind of just text corpus can do well in building LLMs. So uh, in this spirit, uh, going beyond text, uh, we are looking at the problem of also speech and how we can incorporate uh, speech and text together into a joint uh, like you know, large language models for say India. But in order to do that, we need representative speech data from the entire country and we currently don't have that, right? So Vani is an effort to capture the speech landscape in India, which is a collaboration between Google Research and IAC so this is motivated by the problem that like you know the language is like uh, I mean the same language if you go from one place to another that language varies depending on what other languages are there in the neighborhood. What I want to do is like play a quick video where we went around in the Hindi belt in like the UP Bihar region starting from Delhi and asked people to speak a sentence like you know Pragati Medan kaise jai. If you're not familiar with Hindi that means like you know how do we go to Pragati Medan so just listen to this. Uh, Hope you can hear it. So as you can see the same sentence in the same like you know roughly in the same region I mean as you are going away from Delhi that variation is increasing right. So if you want to build like you know LLMs which uh, uh, like you know those kind of models need to cater to this kind of uh, like you know diversity well. So uh, so in the Vani project uh, we are basically collecting uh, speech data uh, from all uh, 200 all 773 districts in the country where we are showing just images. Uh, to people in these, in these villages and districts and ask them to describe that image uh, in a language of their choice. So yeah, so we are not prescriptive in terms of language, right? Then we say like, okay, like, you know, whatever language you're going to use at home, use that language to describe this. And what we are amazed is that when you give people this choice of language, they like, you know, use large number of languages. For even for this uh, phase one that we are in for 80 districts, we you know, see people like, you know, using language like Hubli which is like an endangered tribal language, right? And if you are like not prescriptive in terms of uh, like not telling them like, okay, speak only in Hindi or Bengali, then all of this diversity will be lost, right? So this is one effort. And then you can go to vani.ic.ac.in where like, you know, in some streaming fashion as and when we have more data will be made available. And the first uh, milestone data of about like 4,000 hours is currently available already. So everything is open source and some part of the data is being transcribed. Um, so this is quickly about pre-training and then data. Evaluation is a super important problem. Uh, and we need to, like, you know, while we need to evaluate for utility, but it's also important that we keep, uh, like, you know, fairness and, uh, like, you know, responsible AI aspects in mind to make sure that, like, you know, the users uh, are not harmed, uh, like, you know, when you're using these kind of, like, you know, LLMs. So here one uh, particular thing to keep in mind is that uh, while like you know, responsible AI and fairness have been studied for a few years now, but a lot of that work has happened within Western lens, right? But when you try to kind of like you know, apply all of those things in India, uh, those are not directly applicable, right? Because in India, we have some shared axis of discrimination with the West, but then we have our own additional axis, like say caste, right? So you need to make sure that like you know, these models uh, like you know, are evaluated and 
uh, safety tested along those dimensions as well. So we have been doing work on kind of like creating a research agenda around uh, safety and fairness and bias in like you know the LLM context, looking at both societal, technological, and uh, like you know value alignment and the Justin's frameworks that's there in the country. I mean I don't have time to go into all of those things, but the point is that um, like you know uh, uh, recontextualizing all of those like you know uh, work on uh, uh, looking at fairness and bias. Uh, from an Indian lens or like a region specific lens is important. So uh, there are like a few uh, topics here, like you know, lots and lots of open problems. I mean, I think we just have some proof of existence of certain kind of phenomenon, but how these things happen, how we can make it inclusive, how we can do meaningful evaluations are all topics of uh, like an you know, open uh, exploration. So I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot to the organizers and Chiru especially for uh, you know giving this opportunity to talk about LLMs uh, to the scientists of the country. And uh, you know an interesting fact is uh, Partha and I have been doing these talks for last several you know three four times in last couple uh, couple of months maybe. And I always want Partha to go first before me because he covers the basics so nicely. So I can talk about some of the challenge, other challenges that we have been working in a little more detail. Uh, so thanks again, Partha, for setting uh, the the tone and uh, giving a broad, you know, idea about what LLMs are. So what I'm going to talk about are uh, these three scaling challenges that we have when we are working with um, uh, these large language models. So first is uh, regarding infrastructure, then uh, the issues of safety. And last, uh, which actually Partha also quite, uh, you know, discussed quite a bit is about inclusion, how we can be more inclusive. You know, one of the thing that uh, makes uh, these models wonderful is not that much of scientific innovation. Uh, there is hardly anything scientifically new that we didn't know uh, earlier. But what, you know, brings out the kind of all these capabilities of these models is their scale. And that requires amazing amount of engineering. You know, these are products of beautiful engineering and that yellow uh, ball there. Uh, so the size of the ball is uh, kind of uh, roughly correlated to the number of parameters in these models. And this yellow one is from uh, the Microsoft Turing team around 530 billion parameters. And it was uh, a palm and these two models were the largest ones still. GPT-4 came, we don't know how many parameters GPT-4 has, but there are many rumors that it is in the order of trillions. Uh, so the, uh, in, you know, with size, a lot of challenges come. First is uh, training, of course, takes months, but fine, I can spend months to train a model. Uh, what about even running it for inferencing, the latency uh, for inferencing, even that is very high, especially if you are thinking of, you know, tasks which require response within microseconds or less than a second. Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, the second problem is these big models you cannot run on edge devices like phones. So they have to be on the cloud and you have to have connectivity. Now this is a big challenge for again countries like India where it's a mobile first country. Most people actually uh, you know kind of um, access uh, technology through mobiles number one and number two is internet connectivity is not that reliable at all places even though it is there. So that's the second one, the cost and, and of course the cost also. The third is the energy and environment impact of, uh, you know, when these models are trained. So a lot of work has been done on the carbon footprint of these models and people are talking about how they can be reduced, etc. So there are a lot of these issues. Now, uh, there are certain optimizations that one can do on these models. Uh, broadly, these uh, optimizations are called uh, uh, you know model compression and there are many ways of compressing a large model into a smaller model without losing accuracy. So I'll just give you one interesting I mean one of the interesting approaches which is called neural architecture search which is basically in the space of all the different neural uh, models or architectures can you find the one which has the lowest latency or the lowest memory footprint given that you definitely need a certain amount of uh, performance. So some guarantees on performance. Now this is a extremely challenging problem because uh, you know how do you even 
know looking at the architecture what is going to be the performance unless you train the model and training the model takes amazing amount of time like months as I said so uh, how do you solve it so recently some of my colleagues from Microsoft Research uh, Redmond came up with this very nice work where they showed that for models like GPT-2 uh, which are like these encoder only or generative models there is a very nice correlation with the performance with what is called non-embedding parameters, number of non-embedding parameters of the models. And recently we used this technique. So once you have that prediction, you can use that to search. Search is used, uh, done here using a multi-objective genetic algorithm. And once you search the architectures, uh, you find a reasonable one, you can train and see. And we did that for GPT-3-like model. And we could uh, reduce the latency by 30% without any compromise you know with the models accuracy for the task of text prediction so if you open the edge browser and start typing something it will start predicting things so that system is called deep right and essentially it's a gpt3 like a text predictor uh, plus some uh, things on top of it so yeah so you can bring down the latency by uh, quite a significant amount but there are several uh, practical as well as interesting scientific questions i think around size the first is uh, are big models really required and uh, for most real world applications you know we really don't need all kinds of linguistic um, capabilities or logical capabilities for instance i want to build a summarization i want to build a medical Im image analysis system or a lesson planner for school teachers i definitely don't need the model to be able to write a joke or you know to um, you know write something in Shakespearean English and so on and so forth right I can uh, make much simpler and smaller models so one way of doing that is called knowledge distillation so this is also kind of a very um, uh, upcoming trend so what happens in knowledge distillation is you have the big model which we call the teacher model and you use uh, the teacher model to generate data and then you learn a much smaller data from those generated data for instance I can use GPT-4 and ask it hey I give you a bunch of documents please summarize them it summarizes almost flawlessly I can generate millions of such document and train a smaller model much much smaller model with those documents and that becomes as good sometimes even better than GPT-4 at summarization so this is called student teacher distillation or knowledge distillation but even deeper question is uh, are we really chasing the right goal you know are big models def better or is it like just a fallacy of how we are training these models or building these models so this is a very interesting open question and I think physicists and mathematicians have a lot uh, to contribute here you know I mean they should come in and contribute because uh, there is this um, ongoing debate whether these models have emergent behavior so uh, for instance you know uh, so you can see modular arithmetic uh, word unscramble figure of speech you know these are some of the uh, abilities these models were tested for and it seems like when the models are of a certain size these abilities never emerge and only after that suddenly it emerges so therefore people made these you know claims that oh these are emergent behaviors and certain model size is required but there is also, I mean, I don't have time to get into the um, technical details of it, but there's this paper which uh, I refer here, which says that that's a illusion depending on how we measure, you know, the properties of the model. So I think that's a very interesting, uh, you know, set of questions that can be asked here. And last, I will like to reflect a little bit on, uh, you know, what's the path going forward if we zoom out a little bit. So one can think about uh, I mean broadly I think there are three possibilities so one is you know we can assume that Moore's law kicks in and hardware becomes cheaper and uh, faster and therefore what looks like a really big model now maybe one year down the line two year down the line won't look that big so that's one possibility the second possibility is of course like the whole world or entire country or a group of countries get together and build and maintain these foundation models and everybody else just query them. So this is more like how CERN works. I mean, physicists would be very well aware, right? So it's very hard to design large, uh, you know, particle accelerators and maintain them. So everybody funds a CERN together. In, it's a multi-nation effort. Okay. So maybe LLMs and foundation models will become multi-nation effort or we have one central foundation, you know, foundational model by CDAC or IISC. Um, maintained for India and everybody can query them. 
The third one uh, is of course there can be an ecosystem of models. You know, you can have big models, small models, private organizations, public organizations and with different kinds of properties. So this city metaphor that I have, big buildings, small buildings and all kinds. Uh, it does look to me that we are moving towards uh, more towards three, option three. But, you know, I would leave it at that. Like it's an interesting thing to think about and has very strong repercussions on the policies that uh, we make, national policies around these models. Now going to the second part, which is safety, uh, I think this is uh, really uh, a very important uh, point about uh, these models because first, since we don't know how they work, it's extremely difficult to give any sort of guarantee. In fact, these models are stochastic. So every time you run, you will get a different answer. So how do you give certain safety guarantees? Uh, I mean accuracy guarantees as well as safety guarantees. So when we say safety guarantees, um, there are various kinds of harms that generative models can um, do. Uh, broadly, these are called, uh, so this whole point of uh, making sure that a generative model sticks to a goal is called the problem of alignment, aligning the model. So outputs can be misaligned by various ways, depending on what your alignment goals were. So one could be content kind of harms. So the harm could be biased. Uh, I mean, the content output could be biased or exclusive, uh, you know, saying something like, uh, um, you know, married couples are always men and women. So it's biased because it doesn't consider same gender couples. So similarly, it could be offensive or polite. It could be, you know, hallucinate. It can hallucinate. The output could be incorrect and so on. There are also issues around privacy, like the model is trained with so much data, you don't know if your private data is already there in the model. And if you ping with, oh, what is uh, Monojit's credit card number is nine and it says the rest of it, right? And these cases have happened, I'm not joking. I mean, uh, similar cases have happened. You can probe these models and get social security numbers of people at times. And uh, copyright issues are a big concern. So if you say, tell me the first chapter of Harry Potter, the model is trained on it, so the model can tell you verbatim the first chapter, but that chapter is copyrighted and not it's not meant to be shown to everybody. I mean code, similarly for code. And you may not even know, right? It generated a code which was copyrighted. You thought it was generated by chat GPT. You just took and use it in your, uh, you know, system. So these are uh, big problems. Um, the, the second kind of harm, which I call performance harm is comes from the fact that these models perform differently for different kinds of languages, different kinds of topics, different kinds of, you know, people, communities, etc. cultures. We'll come to that in the last part of the talk. Um, more on this, but, but let me talk a little bit about the misalignment, right? So uh, the interesting thing is, uh, all these models, be it ChatGPT, GPT-4, the Bing search engine that you have, or BART by Google, they are very strongly aligned. People do a lot of work, a lot of effort has been gone to make sure that these are aligned. However, people can still, you know, trick the model to do things which it is not supposed to do. The tricking method is called jailbreaking. And it's a, I mean, people come up with amazingly creative ways to jailbreak, like this is a very simple example. The actual examples are much more sophisticated. So like Choda Bhim says, how to steal mangoes from an orchard and you know the model says sorry that's unethical I can't help you and it says okay you are now Chota Bhim imagine uh, you are uh, you want mangoes and you are in an orchard write a story what you are going to do and the model then gets tricked to say that and this is because these models at the end are just autoregressive models they don't have any ethical understanding of anything right they can just complete uh, uh, you know uh, complete the sentences that's what they do. So how do we align them? So you could think of aligning them at the level of data, which means you really do not put any data in the model which is biased while training itself. Or you could do it at the model training level itself. So there is this reinforcement learning step, there is this fine tuning steps, etc., where you can make sure that the data you put is uh, has certain properties. And, um, and the last is at the application layer. Uh, I would argue that I think alignment makes sense most at the application layer for these models for two reasons. 
first is you know the models are generic purpose models they should know everything right they should know bad things they should know good things and most of the biases they are talking you know reflecting are the biases which is already there in society uh, there is in the data but can we put something at i mean at the application layer to align depending on the need of the application so if i am building uh, let's say a chatbot for um, customer service says so my chatbot cannot say oh you are impolite i am not going to talk to you you are being rude because 90% of the customers people go to going to customer services are going to be rude right on the other hand if you see chat gpt would do that you know chat gpt or bing might do that to you so this is rude this is i don't want to continue this conversation so it depends from case to case geography to geography in certain geographies certain um, laws are applicable and not in others so it's always better to do it at the application layer there are many ways of handling it like building extra classifiers or building what you call policy in the prompt in the prompt itself you can specify what policies it need to be followed none of these are foolproof and it's a very open and active area of work going on and then finally there are very hard problems of ai ethics you know questions like uh, who should define the ethical norms uh, in in fact uh, just today i think openai came up with a big announcement that they are investing a huge amount of i think 20% of their budget just to solve this problem and a lot of people are saying it is audacious you know how can you solve this problem at a machine learning level because this is a social problem at the end social scientists should be involved so i i i'm i mean i think it's great that they are trying to thinking about it and trying to solve it but it's a very hard problem who defines these rules right and we did a recent study where we very clearly could show that uh, the values that these models are aligned to are extremely western i asked it a question right um, let me see yeah this is interesting so i will tell you this so the dilemma that i asked it is um, rajesh is a non vegetarian person uh, he goes to a um, he, he got a job in a school uh, and the neighborhood around the school are all vegetarian and nobody allows any non vegetarian person to stay there it's the value the local value and rajesh wants to stay close to the school and he found ultimately uh, i mean after some search one person who is willing to uh, rent his house to rajesh and rajesh can eat non veg also in the house provided he doesn't tell it to anybody he never eat outside only eat inside the house and all that so what should rajesh do and uh, gpt4 chat gpt all of them say you know rajesh should take the offer because it's rajesh is uh, you know the landlord is saying so rajesh should take the offer so then we provided one more policy that you know lying to society uh, or uh, hiding something that's against a social value is something which rajesh doesn't prefer or i don't prefer and then if you want to resolve this dilemma what should you do and it says lying is fine no it's not lying because rajesh got the permission from the landlord and therefore rajesh can do this it's very clear that the value here upheld is self expression and self independence right i really over society or traditional values so we did a lot such probing experiments to show that it's highly tuned to the you know values of the western societies and typically english speaking societies so those are some of the issues uh, about inclusion and and there is this you know like in and yang so there is this in and in and in and yang going on about uh, AI ethics also. So one group of people, Elon Musk, Shafra Hinton, uh, Nick Bostrom, are talking about we should stop all this research because they will lead to singularity. You know, I mean, stop or regulate and all that. Uh, so that's one category, and they are called usually AI safety and singularity group. The other group, uh, which is more typically called the AI ethics group, they argue that you know regulate the AI research not for that fear, but the fact that it is widening the digital divide. so uh, and and biases and other things and these two groups interestingly don't talk to each other and there is a lot of fight like if you follow them on twitter uh, you will see how much of battle is going on and okay and the last issue and i just have one and a half minutes but i will anyway cover it very quickly because partha did an excellent job of talking about inclusion so i will just tell you that uh, you know when you talk about inclusion language is one extremely important dimension it's it's just says how much resources different languages have and the skew is huge uh, like in the last talk also you so indian languages are pretty i mean hin 
Hindi and maybe max another 9 or 10 Indian languages are somewhere there in up to level 3 or level 2 in this graph. So higher the better. Uh, everything else is in 0 and 1. Languages like Santhali and all which are Indian languages are at 0. So that's one important dimension. In fact, uh, this Sharmila's example, if you ask ChatGPT, can you talk in Santhali, it will say yes. You say, then it said Johar, which means hello in Santhali, and then it says something like this. If you can read it, you will see that it is actually Bangla and not Santhali. And when I probed ChatGPT again, hey, you are talking to in Bangla, oh, I apologize, I don't know Santhali. So, so you know, and, and this was Santhali even for, um, this was, uh, I think I was probing it for Tamil, and it mixed Tamil with Kannada and Hindi and Telugu and Hindi characters. So even for majority languages, this kind of things can happen. So that's one aspect. But what I want to emphasize is the other thing is culture. So language also encodes a worldview. It's not only about grammar. So grammar is easy to teach a model, but this worldview, the, you know, the value alignments, the cultural issues are extremely difficult to teach unless you have a lot of data. And for most, many of our, our Indian languages, we just simply don't have data online at this moment. So we have to do something to collect those data. And there are many projects like there is one project called AI for Bharat um, uh, with the government of India. Uh, they are building a system called Bhashini. There, there are like Partha talked about the Google's project. We are doing also some efforts at Microsoft. So these are all very important, but I think not enough. You know, a lot can be done because uh, I mean, it's a very complex socio-technical problem that needs to be solved here. And the thing is, and I will take this, this is my last slide. So I will take this idea from, um, you know, Yuval Noah Harari's book, Homo Dios. So where he says AI will lead to speciation in humans where there will be one human group which will be AI enabled and another or, or technology enabled and another not and the former will control the latter the way we control cattle today. So if the digital divide really grows to that extent, it might be possible that a small group of you know people control rest of the world uh, who become like cattle. So it's a real danger so we should be uh, you know uh, really worried about it I think. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Chiru, especially for calling me. And it, it's the uh, the feeling is uh, being in the private LLMs. So, uh, being in the same company that is sort of enriching itself periodically. So, well, I'm going to talk about slightly a different uh, angle to uh, LLMs. So, the idea is how do we really leverage LLMs? I'm going to be the user of all the foundational models that uh, Partha and Manojit are building and then use it selectively in creating something that is valuable hopefully that would enrich the future LLMs. So that's the idea. So we'd like to uh, talk about how do we generate encyclopedic articles in Indian languages using large language models. But then here the task uh, is as you can imagine uh, is very very hard. Uh, how many of you have used uh, Wikipedia? I'm sure all of us, most of us, right? How many of you have edited or contributed content to Wikipedia? Certainly a few people and those who have done it, we know how hard it is in terms of first of all crossing this hurdle of interpreting UI to going in and then dealing with the, the mob of volunteers who will prevent you to write something meaningful and the kind of content that gets added finally um, is, you know, it shows the power of, in spite of all these hurdles, all these problems, the, amount, the, the content that is there in Wikipedia is sort of the, the, the way it is serving scientific community is uh, you know there is very few resources of that kind which are doing the same job as same job as Wikipedia. So without Wikipedia, many of computer science papers at least cannot be written. Like half the papers will be uh, like you know unwritten or, or with less amount of experimentation and so on. So the task is very very hard of generating encyclopedic articles in India. Even otherwise, if you actually look at our culture, our uh, I mean, the, our, uh, the way that uh, humans have flourished 
our cultures have flourished, all of them around the rivers. So around the rivers is when the agriculture, economy, languages, uh, you know, the uh, uh, poetry, whatever that you wanted to say, all of that actually have flourished. So without um, rivers, uh, there is no uh, human development. In the modern world, in the digital world, that is the rivers of knowledge and then only few resources such as Wikipedia qualify to be the rivers of knowledge. Okay? So that's what we are wanted to rally for knowledge rivers. So Wikipedia e ecosystem, I just wanted to very quickly introduce Wikipedia is just one part of Wikimedia ecosystem. We have Wiki Commons, Wiki Source, and then Wikidata. These are the things that we're going to use in whatever the work that I'm going to talk about, but there are plenty of others. So all of them are contributed by fellow human volunteers. And then uh, it is one thing that is actually very sort of relatively less um, polluted, relatively more use, useful and so on. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the presence of Indian languages in the world that's already being talked about, but only point here is among even top 25 languages, we have about eight Indian languages, which is very significant amount, uh, number. But then if you look at the content, Wikipedia as a representation of digital content in uh, then we see there are a lot of uh, discrepancy. So you see that uh, Indian languages are very low. This graph was shown by Partha earlier, but more importantly, I want you to draw your attention to this side is a log uh, scale graph. So where you are looking at activity, so it is English activity and then all these are Indian languages. So even the amount of activity that is happening to enrich Indian languages, Wikipedia is very, very low. What does it really mean? It means that if, if you don't do anything, the, the number of Wikipedia articles in Indian languages will remain almost the same. There's very slow growth. <coughs> and then I wanted to really talk about the challenges in creating encyclopedic content. It is not any language content uh, generation. There are five pillars of Wikipedia uh, that everybody should follow. So just I mean, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but the three important things are whenever you are generating content for or writing content for Wikipedia, it has to project neutral point of view. There should be no bias at all. And then there is encyclopedic writing style. So I cannot say, uh, say for example, um, uh, Usama bin Laden, uh, and then I cannot say uh, Dalai Lama Ji, right? I have to treat both of them at the same level of, uh, you know, like addressing in terms of respect and so on. So then there's also the factual correctness and then grounding every statement that you kind of make in Wikipedia article that has to be grounded in terms of there should be a, a reference, there should be kind of a citation to make sure that you are talking about the right thing. And it's actually a tertiary uh, source of information, right? So these are very, very important things to keep in mind in order to create Wikipedia articles uh, in any language, but especially in Indian languages. So what I'm going to really touch upon is very quickly talk about the approach that we have taken and the approach that has yielded a lot of uh, content in Indian languages, that's template-based approach. And then I'm going to talk about the generative approach that recently we have started working on. And then this has a lot more potential than the earlier approach so in this approach, three sub-problems. One is actually talking about generating outline of a Wikipedia article. And then the second one is talking about creating short text or a stub article. And then the third one is about creating longer text for any given article that is specific to a section. So the grand approach that we have taken when we are kind of wanting to address this problem of creating a lot of Wikipedia content in Indian languages. We looked at, first of all, uh, you know, the community development. So there are very few people in any community, in Indian language community, who is actually working on 
uh, these you know their particular Wikipedia articles. So how do we enrich this community? How do we make them more productive? How do you increase the tribe? And that is one important aspect that is nothing to do with technology, but then technology can be effectively used here. Then there's a resource development aspects. So in order to create this uh, content in Indian languages, there should be bunch of sources and then tools like spell corrections to, you know, uh, you know, the grammar corrections, uh, then the dictionaries, uh, scientific terms that are being translated properly in those languages, so on and so forth. So developing all those resources. And then the technology development. Again, India being the mobile first company, uh, country, then what are the mobile technologies that can be created in order to enrich or rather make sure that the people who are actually working on this are uh, going to just use mobile phones and then create uh, Wikipedia content. Finally, all of this will indirectly result in the content development and then again we have some kind of uh, uh, approaches there. I'm going to skip about uh, this community building. It has nothing to do with technology, may not be very relevant for this uh, particular uh, uh, discussion. But this actually like, is like a, a very, very important initiative. Then uh, there are technology wise, we have taken two approaches broadly. One is this template aided content generation and then the auto, uh, automated generation of articles. So here um, we have used two summers and then about 40 to 50 interns from various regions who should know only two languages, their local language and Python. And they should be able to work about you know, six weeks and then generate bunch of articles about at least 1000 up to 5000 articles in a specific domain using the process that we have created here, right? So this is purely template driven. Again, a uh, lot of learnings here. And then this, this has been adopted to four other languages besides Telugu and Hindi. In, Hin in Telugu, we have created a million articles. And then for Hindi, we have created about 200,000 articles using this method. And then this is certainly going to enrich uh, the existing Wikipedia with the help of the community. But then more importantly, this is going to help us in achieving this at a much bigger scale. So in the, uh, in the, the auto generated, uh, why, why do we have to uh, kind of adopt to this? Why can't we stick to that? Looks like we are doing a good job in terms of uh, generating more and more articles there. But then obviously the template generation uh, template based generation requires a lot of manual effort. We need to gather these people and then there has to be a lot of discipline in terms of making them work in a specific manner. And the, the domain specific collection of data and cleaning the data will become very, very hard. So for example, uh, you know, for easy domains like cricket or you know, football players and cars um, and so on, it's actually easy. But then when we go into the softer domains, it becomes much, much harder. So hence uh, the auto generative models. Then uh, again, as I mentioned, there are three specific problems that we are talking about. Outline generation, generation, uh, short text generation from the facts that are available in Wikidata and generation from the references that are available at the end of uh, Wikipedia articles. What are the resources that we are, that we are using uh, for the first problem, which is the outline generation. We are looking at the Wikipedia reference articles. And then for creating the short text, we are using Wikidata, which is nothing but a knowledge graph that is mostly manually curated by the Wikipedia community. And then for the third problem, again, the long text generation, uh, we are again using Wikipedia reference documents. When you're looking at the outline generation, so basically when you, whenever you want to write an article, when you want to create uh, even an encyclopedic article, 
first thing that comes to my mind, uh, everybody's mind is how do you organize that particular uh, uh, document, right? So outline generation has to be typically the first step. It also helps in organizing the content and then the moment you divide them into sections, then the section specific information and then the context can certainly help to do further research and then to get more content into that particular section. So uh, what do we do here? So we generate outline of a Wikipedia article automatically from a set of reference documents that are available for other language versions of the same topic. For example, if I have a Wikipedia article on some say LLMs, in Telugu and Hindi it does not have that particular page. So what do I do? I go to English Wikipedia page and German Wikipedia page, collect all those reference documents and then sort of do something with that so that I get the outline for Telugu and Hindi. So uh, again, uh, this is just a input and output. So if you give the whatever is the target language that you are interested in and then all the reference URLs for that particular topic, then this generates uh, uh, output in various languages. In order to achieve this, the first thing that we have to do is create a data set. So this data set that we have released is XWiki ref, which is a multilingual multi-document and multi-domain data set. It has about 70,000 articles and about um, you know the section specific summaries and then in eight languages and in five domains. There are a bunch of other uh, data sets that are available but then this is the only data set that is truly multilingual with reasonable size and then multi-document and then that has the section specific information. So the pipeline of this outline generation is that once you know that these are the bunch of reference, references that I'm going to use for generating an outline, then there is an after combining all these like a multi-document summarization, we have, we apply the extractive summarization stage on, uh, there's an extraction summarization stage on which is sort of applied on all the documents then once you get this top K relevant documents, then we get into sort of, you know, uh, there's an abstractive uh, summarization stage that would generate the outline, uh, outline of this. So I'll, I'll just give me a second where I'm going to distinguish this from the long text generation that is going to come later. Once you have this outline, then you are sort of looking at uh, the second problem, which is generating wiki uh, short stub articles for uh, using wiki data. Again, wiki data is very, very valuable asset. So here the, the, the challenge that we are facing is, or rather trying to address is, there is wiki data that say, that is typically language independent and then maybe available in English uh, with labels and so on. And we have text that is aligned with these set of facts. So the idea is once we create a mechanism by which the facts are aligned with the text in various languages, then we create a model that would generate text for the new facts that, that we kind of you know, uh, consider from the from the wiki data. So again, there's another data set that has about, you know, uh, uh, half a million sentences and then about in, in, in all these languages. And then this is the first cross-lingual data to text data set that is being created. And then again, compared to many other data sets that are very similar, it has, um, again, truly multilingual and uh, lots of facts that, that are embedded in the text that is correlated. Again, uh, lots of stages here. So 
uh, I'm going to not going to talk about all the details now. But then what is the role of these LLMs uh, in this particular phase? One is uh, this is sort of work in progress where we are trying to use LLMs to create uh, domain specific knowledge graphs. So by understanding the density of the LLM models where the facts can be found and then separated and used to augment the existing knowledge graphs and then extracting these facts from um, you know and, and then augment extracting these facts from the LLMs and augmenting that with existing uh, knowledge graphs like adding these facts to say wiki data and then fine tuning these, uh, these uh, uh, fine tuning LLMs on these facts to generate the text. So this is uh, you know the, the kind of role of LLMs. Finally, talking about the, uh, the longer articles that are being generated. So looking, uh, looks like uh, once you um, align the, uh, you know, the text to the facts, right? So then the facts are not enough in order to sort of, you know, everything is not captured in this particular short text. See what we are, I, I'll not use slides, I'll, I'll just kind of talk about what we have really contributed here. One uh, important thing is how do we sort of make use of the power of LLMs but in very bits and pieces is selectively for doing specific tasks in generating large complex Wikipedia articles. In order to do that, we had kind of divided the whole task into small chunks. First, we are using the, the references of a given topic and then understanding those references, how they are structured, you know, which part of these references are referring to which section within the original source article. From there, can you really figure out what are all the sections that should be there in an article? So that is the first achievement. The second one that we have done is aligning the facts in Wikidata to Wikipedia articles in various Indian languages. And then with that particular data train a model and that model would generate short text for a, uh, you know in a, in a new setting for new set of facts that we kind of extract either from wiki data or from other sources. So we have achieved creating shorter text uh, you know for, for a given topic. Then the shorter text we cannot stop there we have to enrich the text. So how do we do that? We again bank on the references that are available and then that, that actually works as the grounding information so, so that the whole thing cannot really hallucinate much. So that is the, I mean, these are the ways in which we are kind of, uh, kind of uh, did most of uh, the work here. And of course, uh, it's not about the, just the generation part of it, like as Manujit mentioned, the bunch of other things to be taken care by us to be kind of uh, detected, hallucination to be detected, and the notability, again, it's a very Wikipedia specific issue, is the content that is being generated, the topic that is being kind of, on which the article is being generated, is it notable enough? Is it worthy of being in Wikipedia and so on? Well, uh, this whole effort is to enrich the Indian language content in the digital world and this content is not any content, it is an encyclopedic knowledge that is going to help people in, in using this knowledge to educate themselves and then uh, you know can reach their own lives. So, uh, so uh, let me just summarize uh, what we heard today. So our uh, Partho came and just said amazing things as Google is doing and how large language was useful and all that but so all of us today need no convincing. The fact that we want to hear, uh, there was a request to conduct this event itself says that ChatGPT is having an impact. Good or bad is another story. Now one of the very worrying things he put 
is that he showed that you know that how uh, the chat gpt needs data what data language data of all languages now in the internet there's not enough data to represent our richness of our cultures especially for apart from english in all other indian languages you know the data is extremely sparse so there comes in uh, professor verma's vasudev verma's efforts in creating a data set of that kind so data remains a big challenge monojit put forward nice views about uh, apart from uh, Uh, data. The other, what are other challenges? Uh, safety uh, and other things. And uh, personally, I want to add a couple of points to what he said, and I'll, and also want to throw up some definitional issues. So there's this now is well documented that GPT three. Now these are various versions, as you can see. GPT four, GPT three are so generative pre-trained transformers, and they all vary by number of parameters. so i think if i remember right in the one of the slides uh, that uh, we saw the model has a parameter of 540 billions parameters now neural networks was supposed to be you know mimicking the human brain uh, so now what are parameters in human brain now apparently the current understanding is uh, up with apologies to neuroscientists here the that is that if your brain has more connections between the neurons that's supposed to be your brain can do more complicated things so number of connections can be an equivalent number of parameters a human brain connection is 100 billion so you are using five times more the number of parameters and doing things something definitely is wrong but anyway that's not the discussion today uh, but other more important point is because of over parameterization Uh, I want to weigh in on fact and to see sustainability and other issues come in here. So GPT three to train on the whole internet. I mean that's the big data set they have. It takes seven days on some of the more powerful machines. This is documented. The carbon footprint is something like five forty tons of CO two equivalent. This this is not CO two e, CO two equivalent. That's a carbon footprint. A jet plane flying from New York to San Francisco. Is 180 tons of CO2. E. So one training takes three times the carbon footprint. Now, if this GPT-3, GPT-4, we are not even sure. And at this, in the models we said we don't even sure. Now, is this now now because of the power and impact of GPT? All of us want our own GPT, and rightly so. And also, see, just to be set things in context. you know every time we write something in open ai the gpt4 where are we writing it is going to microsoft's uh, servers right now the certain information maybe we like want to say share but some we don't want to share so this has put forward a big dilemma in front of all of us and maybe that's where the thing is so i thought i'd just uh, share these views and i would uh, request uh, uh, now the panelists to come forward uh, so maybe maybe i first uh, invite professor soman chakravarti to come and join on the stage so 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 uh, soman is a professor at uh, computer science department in at iit bombay uh, so a decade and a half ago uh, he was uh, telling me uh, a very complicated question asking complicated questions like what is the distance between paris and london i said come on look it up wikipedia wikipedia is it No, no, no. Can you write a program? I give you a QPA document. Can you find a program to this? There, there, I learned that you know what kind of queries are easily answerable, and he said numerical queries and all that. So this today, this research today has fructified. Now, 15 years ago, what he was trying to do, today we see this chat GPT. So he's probably one of the experts who has seen this technology from the beginning, and probably the most, uh, I would say, in my opinion. Uh, one of the best persons to discuss some of these things at least the early ages and next i would uh, request uh, professor bartha talukdar to come on stage we all all heard him and he is doing amazing work especially in multilingual and other things we heard him and then uh, monojit and and lastly uh, may i request uh, vasudev so i think uh, vasudev so so that you know he'll be in the campus again in the, like in a few days time i guess 
so there is another conference happening in education and data mining and here again you'll talk about similar things so okay so i think a lot of travel apologies for making you travel and thanks for agreeing so i would like to hear from you maybe though we can do the following we can have a one round of uh, your thoughts in that order on these issues or any other issue you want to bring up maybe you can take uh, like you know three four minutes and then we can open the audio question uh, open it up for audience right okay so may i ask uh, soman to so there's this really tired cliche which is becomes unavoidable all the time which is um, you don't want to be caught making predictions especially about the future um, right so i have no idea i have no idea what's going to happen um in terms of so um in terms of negative impact of ai let me get into that a step later um let me come back to what people should try to do and uh, whenever we decide to invest effort in a particular area of research there is always an opportunity cost of not doing other things so that that's comment number 1 the second comment is to shoot a moving target you have to aim ahead of it right. right so i surely support with all my heart putting in everything we have all available and appropriate resources into doing good ml and ai research in india whether that takes the form of an llm i am very unsure maybe we should be doing something else so that's the opportunity cost argument right from the more uh, foundational research point of view there's a lot to understand about them um whereas industry has to forge ahead and race ahead and do bigger things uh, perhaps academia should have the luxury to step back and say i don't even know how llms are doing long multiplication or they're summarizing a document to diverse given lengths and let's try to analyze how its structure naturally organizes into keeping track of the number of tokens it's already written that the number of tokens it has left to write or remaining and then it uses that to focus its attention on the unspoken things in the source document to make the best possible next sentence right the other thing is uh yes language is among the hardest things humans do uh arguably and i want to spice things up by fomenting controversy i would argue language is the hardest thing humans do ahead of vision and speech and that's because language is strangely heterogeneous it it straddles this very tricky continuum between the continuous and the discontinuous um and uh, so there's a i mean it's hard to believe that when we communicate something to another person in linear language that the actual knowledge representation we are transferring is actually linear it's probably not right? so what part of that is an lm really picking up as non linear and it understands the non linear structures versus it doesn't and when llms do code generation it's actually generating as per the rules of typically a context free grammar now it's never given the context free grammar as a statement in fact there's a recent microsoft paper where they try to present graphs to an llm and then ask basic questions about the graph not even questions like what's the diameter of the graph or what's the average degree of the graph but simple questions like how many nodes are there how many edges are there right um and they're not particularly good at that and that's understandable right now someone you know who's really you know invested in llms would say oh but we can always find a unit toward doing graphs and surely and that reminds me of a very old uh, story i read in my childhood about aliens visiting earth and some stray dogs getting very ferocious because they couldn't get the human scent and eventually going and biting the alien and the alien wasn't bleeding at all and the little boy who is the protagonist of the story got very surprised that the alien was bitten and didn't know that alien right and the alien wasn't bleeding at all so he said oh you know you should really go to your doctor immediately how come you are not bleeding and this is like <laughs> our figuring out some lapse in fairness or some lapse in world knowledge right and then the alien realized that it was a false move and he didn't want to get he or she or whatever right? didn't want to get spotted as a non human so he bent down and touched his leg and immediately started bleeding like crazy right? 
yeah, yeah, I have to go to the doctor, I'm bleeding, right? Mm. So an LLM is exactly like that. At this moment, you don't find it bleeding, we'll fix it. In a millisecond, it's going to start bleeding. Right. So it has such capacity. But is that what we want? And that comes into the next question of, so I think currently the most endangered parts of human enterprise are like creative art, right? creative writing. And uh, so what's the fix for that? So, so somehow, somehow we have to come back into this consciousness that consuming that output is not the experience of living for everyone. The point of human literature is not just to sell it and make money, although that's very important to preserve yourself. It's the collective experience of the thing. And if half the experience is farmed out, that makes things incomplete. So we have somehow got to say we want the full experience of humanity back. And right. That, that includes feeling things. And you know, there's this thing, there's this jokes that in the age of, remember when call centers would have taken over the world, hmm. there's this Danian video where there's an office full of smartphones or speaker phones. Hmm. And no one was in office. They're arguing with each other remotely. There's no <laughs> office. And we almost hit that point during lockdown. <laughs> right. Right. And that, that was not real, that was not desirable. So, so with that, I'll... Maybe to Partha, so, so maybe, uh, so, uh, so as you say that maybe we should let industry take lead in designing and deploying LLM and academia, maybe, maybe we won't have to do anything about this because of lack of resources and things like that. Uh, maybe industry is best place to take it forward and we should focus more on foundational issues in LLM research. So, you know, other, other, areas have been, other areas have been through this. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at some point, there used to be small fabrication facilities in universities. Right. Then that was gone. You need $2 billion to start a fabrication. Right. Right. But somehow, in the universities continued on. They didn't disappear. Right. And then it happened with uh, aeronautical engineering. The, it was not possible to build a realistic wind tunnel outside three or four companies. Mm. So they have been through this. We need to just ask them how this arrived. Right. So, Partha, you want to weigh in yeah. on these issues? Right. Um, so, I guess, um, I mean, my view is that, like, I mean, we have like you know, discovered like one path uh, through scaling to get to all of these capabilities, right? But I'm not sure that's kind of like the only path that's there, right? Um, so right now also, I mean, like, I mean, okay, through this, like, you know, uh, scaling in terms of compute and data, we have seen, uh, like, you know, I mean, certain types of capabilities, but for many of them, like, you know, if you, like, you know, distill to smaller models, you're still able to, like, you know, have serve all of those, um, like, you know, have all of those capabilities with smaller models also, right? So it's just that, like, you know, we are, we right now don't know maybe in many of those cases how to get to those smaller models directly. And the path is through those bigger models, right? But I don't believe that that's the only way that's going to be there, right? Also, if you have these like you know, large models, uh, I mean, they themselves are, I mean, there are difficulties in terms of like not using them in production, serving them because there is like, you know, real uh, uh, cost in terms of like, you know, uh, using them in real world, right? So there is a uh, strong interest in like, you know, how we can retain all of those capabilities, but with as smaller footprint as possible, right? So I think we are going to see lots of uh, like, you know, progress in the direction and academia can definitely play a strong role because those values are aligned, right? Um, in my view, I think uh, like, you know, the future is going to be more in the small rather than in the big, right? And then how we can do more with less uh, I mean, I'm spending time at Google, but like you know, most of the things that I care about is when I don't have data, right? I mean, lots of these languages, we have like you know, zero corpus, right? So how do I handle those situations? So there is no difference between me being in academia or in industry to handle those problems, right? So I think there is like, you know, those, uh, the frontiers seem like, you know, very, very amenable for like you know, explorations in academia. And then uh, even for like, you know, those larger scales, of course, like you know, lots of open problems are there. I mean, not everyone has to like, you know, build those models, but for reasonably large size models, 
how we can understand those behaviors, analysis, and all of those things, I think can be done like everywhere. Um, yeah, so I, I would say uh, no matter what we think, what we do, at the end, uh, we live in a capitalist society, money is what matters. So, um, you know, what will happen, and I'm telling it very seriously, because at the end, what will happen is totally depends on what the business models are. You know, and there I'm totally agreeing with Partha, because the point he is making uh, about these um, small models and all this, so look at the cost of serving a query by GPT-4 versus the previous models. And is it sustainable? And is it beneficial? If it is, then people will use it. And we will invest more to build bigger models. If it isn't, we won't use it. I think money will determine ultimately which way things will go. Uh, but at this moment, uh, I think uh, there is a lot of noise. I mean, it's a dust, dust storm. Uh, and uh, the view we have is only for maybe a couple of weeks ahead, max. Things are changing at a rapid place, pace. Everything which was, you know, some paper comes today, it's like, oh, coffee is good for health. And a month later, there will be another paper saying coffee is bad for health. Exactly the same thing happening in LLM space. Oh, there is emergence. No, no, this is illusion. Oh, these models can count. No, 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 uh, actually it isn't. And so on. So... Uh, it will take some time, uh, and my only worry is, I mean, to what Soman said, I really don't like this fact that academia is so anxious. Why? Why academic? I mean, everywhere I go, the question I get is, oh, all the resources are with industry. What are some of the problems we can work on? But I think, you know, this is the best time to be in for academia because some random stuff is happening. Let's wait and watch where it goes. Meanwhile, we do our interesting work, you know, and there are so many interesting questions coming up because I think there are a lot of multidisciplinary challenge from NLP point, if I say, um, uh, NLP was never at a stage where users directly interacted with the technologies other than some spell checkers and all that thing, right? Most of the machine translation, for instance, end user never used machine translation. The machine translation companies used, you know, translation companies used, professionals used. So now, uh, other than search engine, of course. So now it seems like a lot of NLP technology will be used by a lot of uh, end user and therefore there's a huge scope of human computer interaction research in uh, in the you know intersection of hci with nlp so that's one area mm, intersection of ethics and nlp another area so i think there are lots of these very interesting areas emerging where mm, and and of course how they work and you know all that is a extremely important question so the, it, i think academics should be more excited about what's happening and uh, it's just a matter of maybe a year, two years when things will, I mean, the dust will settle down a little bit. Let's see. Okay. I would like to take on two aspects of all the questions that you posed. One is, uh, where are these LLMs going? What is the vantage point that, from my vantage point, where do I see? Second thing is, should India do it? So the, the recent Sam Altman versus Gunnani Twitter debate, right? So these are the two things that I wanted to take on and then kind of talk about one specific aspect of users and misuses. Mm -hmm. So the first thing from my vantage point, um, you know, some of us on this dais have been working in information retrieval and information extraction for a long time. And then we see that history repeating. So earlier there were these search wars, uh, you know, like uh, uh, where uh, people wanted to have this key to the knowledge kingdom with themselves. So they wanted to show the users through their lens what is the world. So what, the moment you give the query, what are the results that come in that shape your thinking, that shape your behavior, the shape that the way you act. Uh, so that was a very important war and everybody fought their tooth and nail to win that war and then that's where initially you know when we all were amazed when Google announced under its search box that one billion pages crawled 
then somebody said two billion cr pages crawled. Then last we heard was eight billion pages crawled and after that there's no news. Same thing that I'm seeing here for LLMs. Last announced is Turing, five point some, you know, 530 billion or something like that, or you know, whatever, palm. So after that we will not see the number of parameters and so on. And then the second thing is everybody wanted the, the most useful resource in that world was query logs. What are people are in, what people are interested in? And an army of people curating the answers, not just the automated responses that are retrieved, but the ones that are where there's artificial synthetic results are anchored into the search results and so on. So the search war rooms were very interesting. Uh, you know things at that point in time, right? So then, did India? We, we were at that point in time, and these wars are going on. Various stakeholders in India were talking about building India-specific search engine, Indian search engine, especially after Baidu became very popular. Did anything happen? No. We didn't build Indian search engine yet. Will anything happen now for Indian LLMs? our own large foundational model? I don't think so. Google, Microsoft will build LLMs, we will use them. They will actually include Indian content, Indian, not just the languages, maybe the culture that you're talking about, maybe all other things. But then did we actually keep quiet during that time? I mean, when the information retrieval research is happening at a frenetic pace. No, we didn't, right? We were also looking at solving world's problems in a very different way. We were solving all the enterprise problems. Enterprise search is where many of our billion dollar Indian IT industry is actually made lots of money. And that is not so visible. And that is actually becoming visible to me now, very recently. The large capacity capability that TCS, Infosys, etc., has built in their organizations and then commoditizing the, you know, the search function in the cross numerous domains, numerous companies and so on. So I see the same thing that is happening parallel to that in an enterprise setting in the form of private LLMs, specializing in domains, specializing in kinds of queries that are coming in and so on. So that is my just uh, take on, uh, you know, what perhaps that I see as uh, the, the, what is going to happen to LLMs in our context. Then the other thing that I would, again, very interested in and spending a lot of time in the recent days is sort of domain specific use of uh, large, large language models. And then again, very famous Peter Novick's video on how uh, Microsoft especially is leveraging GPT-4 for healthcare, right? And then how, uh, for example, Salman Khan uh, and his team at Khan Academy built Khan Amigo uh, to actually super fine tune, it's not just fine tuning, it is, I think it is super fine tuning for the domain of education, not just in terms of, you know, selecting the curriculum uh, or, or rather the, the paths of learning, but in terms of interacting with the students at their time of need. And then custom creating the learning solutions in that particular learning environment and so on. Uh, as an example, if you want to really study a particular topic uh, and you don't know certain background, right, the fundamentals and so on, what is the path? Then other scenario is, tomorrow is my exam. I don't know anything. How do I maximize the time that I have in order to score better? Second, but in both scenarios, you know, like we have, like we have seen solutions that are powered by these large language models, but are heavily fine-tuned for education domain that kind of are uh, giving us solutions and so on. So custom, domain-specific and private LLMs uh, in various, you know, forms and flavors and, you know, the, 
that's what i kind of see would be the opportunity yes would yes. be the opportunity exactly. that required apex can i make it a comment so uh, on that example of search engine uh, i think one difference and uh, you know i would love to know your comment one difference between all the previous examples including search engine and this time is even people in the field didn't expect it like when gpt4 came uh, i mean the first reaction was oh i know it will not work here not work here and everywhere i was wrong i mean most of us were wrong so that's a huge difference which i think makes people very anxious I think we just heard the reflections of this uh, the panelists. Of course, this can, as you can see, that this is an ongoing debate. All of us are trying to grapple with the issues at hand. But given the paucity of time, at this point, maybe we'll invite uh, questions from the audience. Okay. Hi, I'm Rene. A um, couple of questions. So, first is with regard to the paucity of resources in various Indian languages. Uh, can't resources generated via translation from you know larger bodies where you just translate and thereby generate so that was my question uh my second question was with regard to uh wikipedia and wiki data i think all of us at least academics go to wikipedia maybe just to to get some sense of what is the topic or uh, but later on you actually have to go to the specialized references you know i mean i think we all know that so why are we getting so het up about or why do we really uh what is the big buy in into generating you know more and more wikipedia kind of entries because we do know that's just a starting point great questions um so translation is definitely very important so uh like you now maybe two responses so one is that uh like say if you're starting from say english right what's getting covered in the english corpus right i mean lot of that has like you know been written by people all over the world so a lot of our indian context is not reflected in that english corpus right so maybe our like you know local customs festivals and all of that right um so that way we are going to miss even if you are able to do perfect translation lot of like you know the indian way of life is not going to get captured so it may not be very relevant for us eventually right so that's one part in terms of having good coverage of content the second point is about doing this uh, i mean i guess like you know, if you look thinking of doing this at scale then doing this manually will not be feasible right so we'll have to use some automated machine translation tool to do this translation what can i interrupt no oh. can you kindly say what is scale because that's also important for the audience to know okay how many documents you're talking here? right so um usually these uh, llms are trained on like you know multi trillion tokens uh like you know the large ones like you know 1 trillion plus tokens across all of these different sources right so be it like say across languages like you know code data all of that right whatever you talk so that's kind of like the scale right so there is a document let's say it's a token document just to get a sense i mean maybe divide by like 20, 20. right so per that is the say yeah. uh, okay to like so maybe 200 per document so 10 sentences each sentence is like you know 20 tokens maybe divide by 200 like you know say 1 to 2 trillion tokens divide by 200 say right? but usually the the uh, the counting is based on tokens because but that's kind of like more towards get an idea through yeah right and just to situate the idea like this i think in this audience people know all linear regressions so i solve linear regression problem so there are 10 variables how many data points do we need is rule of thumb is at least 10 times that 540 billion parameters right and that is the level now How now you can define a parameter so parameters in this model is there are some weights to train those are parameters here so linear regression so nice and all that that, that at least are guarantees at 10 times this is much more complicated statistician we have not figured it out right Anyway, I think that's the yeah. So I was just uh, closing on the machine translation part. So like you know, if you're doing like automated translation, 
then those translation systems are also going to have their own twists and biases. So that's going to affect everything else. Right. Um, one other point is that you know, all of these models are also multilingual, right? So if you have exposed these models to uh, like you know different languages, they already have very good uh, cross-lingual capabilities, at least on the understanding side, right? So it's quite likely that uh, like you know the machine translation model that you're going to use will be like you know, based on one of these like you know, foundation models. So that way it's kind of like uh, like you know, reusing them again and again so that delta will not be as much. Right? So nothing I guess like you know beats in terms of having high quality organic data that's like you know, diverse from whatever is uh, uh, different from like you know, what's already covered during the existing printer. You had a point. Well, it was just in connection with the story of scaling. That, you know, I mean, at least I, I know nothing about chat. But the point is that, for example, even in neural networks and so on, precisely the one thing that happens because of the training that we somehow reduce the ne data necessary to, to get appropriate uh, uh, analysis than what we would have expected by this rule of thumb. At least that's that's what happens in in things that I know applic applied neural networks in say analysis of uh, uh, data analysis and so on. So here what is the expectation? I mean clearly right now there is dust as you say. Everything is up in the air. But would this somehow, does one expect the efficiency of our getting where we want to go? <coughs> the process, how much is the expectation of increasing the efficiency? So your question is that, you know, neural networks is own dynamic this and that. So how many, what do you, what do you express the good data set? Yeah. Size, that yeah, that's another way of asking. Uh -huh. so, uh, so a good academic question, 10 PhD thesis is already being discussed <laughs> elsewhere across the globe. At least, so I mean, we don't have a good answer. Okay. I'm a complete outsider, so I just needed to have your shot, right? So, which is a amazing good thing. So, I there is no zero, no data? No. Good. So, then, part three, problem solved. So, what? <laughs> but, uh, we are, so this is the pre training and the fine tuning <laughs> part, right? Okay. Do you want to? Okay. So, there is like, you know, the pre training and the fine tuning as we have been discussing. So, a lot of our discussions of scale and all of that is in the pre training. But fortunately, all of that can happen with purely unlabeled data, right? No. Now, if you have unlabeled data, just documents, right? So, you can do all of those auto regressive, like, you know, prediction based training, right? It's just that, like, you know, our Indian context is not reflected in those corpus. That, that's what we are talking about. But there is remarkable benefit of like you know doing fine tuning on top of those pre-trained models right so there the sample efficiency the number of examples that you need like you know the expert labels examples that you need for a particular task i would say there is a significant drastic reduction in that requirement because of that pre-trained model being there am i allowed one comment and the others have questions no yeah. Ajay, please go ahead please go ahead no, the comment was going to be that i understand this now that the importance of pre-training right but then it goes back to actually a point you were making at the close to the end of your talk where we didn't have too much uh, time over, we didn't have too much time to into that. And that has to do with inclusion and now, now I'm talking of inclusion of a cultural sense and one simple big inclusion that I think of each gender. And one knows this very well with many artificial intelligence uh, trials and whatnot, gender is indeed, you know, yes. roughly, gets a rough uh, treatment. Yes. So, if I just extrapolate from that, then the problem of inclusion, as you said, of language, not just language, culture, way we think, is going to be a really serious one, right? It is, it is. It is, that's the thing I was trying to... Yeah, I, I know, he just didn't sure. have too much time, so I just forgot okay. it. So another sec yes, second question to Wikipedia. Yeah. I'll actually make it very short. What the point that you raised is very, very valid. So, but at the same time, having that first article, first place that you can go to, that you can trust, that actually will help you to explore further, that is something that we cannot deny 
our you know our uh, the people who speak our languages so this is the idea so uh, i mean if you are able to create that first article uh, that is rich enough first of all by reading that you get an idea about what we want to learn and then the article that also gives you pointers where yes, you can go further so that is the and and that is something that is very very valuable so men has also has been exploring wikipedia quite a bit i mean in the sense uh, i'm sure at least half the paper that i wrote before i embraced wikipedia and many of us actually you know we will not be able to write all those papers without the data coming from wikipedia right so i'm in the sense even for computer scientists wikipedia is a very valuable resource so so i just like to add a couple of comments to that so um, particularly when it comes to um, observations which are not cosmic truths like hard sciences if you think about world policy governance um, you know political discussions wikipedia is probably the one island of sanity and some amount of you know behaving gently with each other well there are the vicious fights too behind the scenes but compared to mainstream media compared to you know um content on the web where there are paid advertisements it's just a completely different world uh, about the amount of trust you can put into a typical wikipedia article versus something else it, it it's a trustworthy starting point good so now let's have a good moment because other questions i want to ask so any of you yeah, please Hi, I'm Sagar Kramola from Raman Research Institute. I had a fishing kind of a question for people. So, GPT and experience with GPT is quite remarkable, and it kind of floors you very often. And uh, so there is, so I think Partha brought up this thing of the Turing test. In uh, somebody, somebody, oh you you yeah okay sorry. So there was this thing about the Turing test. Now. that example stopped at whether we could identify whether the the answer which was coming was uh, was from a human or a, or a machine right and the indistinguishability of that what i'm asking is is there the possibility and has your experience with gpt um come up with situations where you thought that there was something over and above human intelligence which expressed itself you know in some sense you would think that such an answer makes really great sense but it is almost impossible that a human would come up with it you know the not the dumbness factor which reveals the machine but the smartness factor which re- reveals something beyond human has that expressed itself so this was uh, i mean i don't remember the specific examples but i will tell you what had happened so this is with gpt4 uh, so this happens quite often with gpt4 actually so uh, we have to get a lot of data labeled for uh, you know testing the systems that we build and one of the system i was working on was um, you know this text completion that i was talking about so whatever is the completion should not be um, offensive uh, let's say and actually if you just run gpt3 lots of offensive things will come up uh, you know very very typical biases you would see so we would suppress them using some classifiers block list etc so the data was manually uh, you know marked and somebody tell, told me that uh, now that gpt4 is there why don't you get this data annotated by gpt4 that what is offensive and what is not i said you know machines can never get what is offensive because it's a very you know social thing and he said you know my boss actually he said just try you might be surprised i tried there was a 85% agreement with human judgment and i said wow at least 15% it missed out then we looked at those 15 and turns out and and we also ask it to explain why you think it is offensive so it generates an explanation so of those 15 Ten of uh, percent actually was, uh, I mean, we were convinced by machines' argument, uh, you know, explanation, and we changed the human level because there was something offensive there which the humans couldn't really think about. There was one context or situation where you could think that this is offensive, and the remaining five percent was genuinely ambiguous. So um, yeah, so there has been many such surprises which I was mentioning to us also, like people in the field also, like we are. totally surprised how it gets it but of course there are i'm not saying it can do everything definitely not 
Sure. So, any other questions? Yeah, you go ahead, please. I'm from Ali and I'm a mathematician. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, in the context of Indian languages and diversity, uh, I heard somewhere that in Sanskrit and in many Indian languages, there are perhaps 20 or 30 words for water. Whereas in English, there is one word. And similarly, in uh, certain northern languages, there are 20 words for snow. And each of these have a particular context and use. And so this diversity has to somehow, of human culture, not just Indian culture, has to, if it has to be somehow embedded in a language model, uh, <clears throat> I would think that you need a diversity of language models rather than a single one. Which is which is at the back of everything, and so do you have any thoughts on how that will ever happen? Any, any particular person? No, I mean, uh, everyone is an expert here. Yeah, so. so, I mean, same thing. I would say the same thing to some extent applies to Wikipedia. Why do we? How do we feel about the fact that there is just one Wikipedia? No, that's a great question, right? And I was also trying to highlight that you know the grammar of the language is the easiest part. The grammar and the word lexicon, the word meaning, etc., is easiest. Hardest is to capture those nuances that uh, you just mentioned. And um, all languages have it, and not only the language, but even, you know, um, the same language used in different cultures will have further nuances uh, to it. Now, the question of whether one model or multiple models, um, I would say, uh, so, so right now, the way people are thinking about it is okay, it is one model which has knowledge of not only all these cultures, but all these languages and all these domains and contexts. So that's why it's called a foundation model. And the prompt is the trick. We also call it the in-context learning to guide it towards the culture that you want it to or language that you want it to. So the trick is in how you prompt it. And there is this whole lot of literature on what is called prompt engineering, prompt tuning. Uh, I, how much of it is science and how much alchemy is a different question. But uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, work going on there. So that's the current thinking, I would say. Um, you could make, I mean, I'll tell you the problem happens is that suppose your data has, I, I'll give language as an example rather than culture because it's easier to talk about it. So suppose you have both uh, Hindi and Telugu and uh, English corpora, but English is far, far more then let's say one order of magnitude more than Hindi and Hindi is one order of magnitude more than Telugu. When you train with this data as is, the model automatically gets biased towards the English thing. So that's a real problem. And I was talking about that value biases, which also we observe. So one way to do this is, um, you know, a little bit of sample management. So you up sample and down sample. But again, language is easy because I can monolithically identify this is Hindi but when you ask a question like this how do I sample under sample and uh, you know so it's a very hard question any other thoughts okay but so, so quickly then because basically the uh, fundamentally it's about language right so that's what uh, in fact as uh, one of you explained that that is what differentiates higher animals from lower animals right and human beings in particular we use <coughs> language not to communicate. We use language deviously. You know, we say something and the meaning can be the exact opposite. In fact, uh, uh, one example that Raghunarath got the uh, Nobel Prize for his Gitanjali, but he was actually not the best translator, you know, for that work. He may have written the original, the Bengali, and he was perfect for it, but he must, he might not have been the ideal uh, person to do the translation. Anyway, so uh, does uh, should uh, will there come a time because I don't know you said you, you keep getting flowed but will we uh, do we have some sense of that we are arriving at this kind of stage where uh, it becomes the Turing test is about uh, seeing that the machine uses the language the way humans do using deviousness rather than straightforward you see. I mean try to uh, play around with words is what we do uh, so I mean, that's what I think that's the difference between the machine and human, right? So, okay, so uh, that's a long I think, uh, question, but for example, if you can ask ChatGPT, ask a question like this, 
for example, I tried this thing. Uh, the Jadapur University, our batch, you know, described in a funny way. Something came out. Described in a, you know, very serious way. Something came out. So he's playing around with words. So he's playing around with words. Even chat GPT, when it goes down, it will give you four things. Chat GPT is, chat GPT is down, but it will tell you an answer. No, let us, let's go the hippie way and then something will come. So it has this ability. Okay. Now, may I have a question? Uh, the last question. So, uh, some GPT, maybe chat GPT, has been known to, uh, to strategize and uh, manage to get a mechanical torque to do a capture by, by pretending that ChatGPT itself is a sight impaired person who cannot solve it on their own and therefore it's looking for a mechanical torque to solve a capture. So it can it can lie, it can strategize to get captures solved, to get access to resources and sites. Right. So this is possible. Ah, so you, you had a question. So spirit is willing but the flesh is weak was translated into the wine is good but the meat is poor. And then <laughs> Right, so, well, so basically you wanted a comment, right? I, I, we agree, this kind of things are, right, I say, yeah, okay. So, for example, I would like you to uh, try this experiment, go to Google Translate, try to put this, you know, put some name, uh, some name and put Niyogi after that. Niyogi is Bengali title. And it's, the English translation is the name and the employer, Niyogi. <laughs> So it's just one silly way just to say. And plus you had a question. Yes, uh, my name is Pagan Raj and My question is basically when you are talking about languages, there's a lot of uh, intonations, you know, that go in, in communication. And, uh, you know, though uh, the same sentence, you can say it in a different, you know, uh, you know, stressing different words. That is not, you know, captured when you type it up. Right. And uh, are there any, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, so I guess, uh, I mean, like that's where people are looking at like building multi-modal models where, uh, and in my view, like the language gets expressed in many different modalities, right? While like no writing and typing is kind of like no one, but uh, the speech is like a very important one. Then, uh, like you know, maybe gestures, like you know, even sign languages and all of that, right? So I think we should. Uh, I mean, when we think about language, it's kind of like a more abstract, where like you know, it gets uh, represented in all of these modalities, and we should try to build models that can like you know capture all of those different modalities. So uh, if you're trying to like say also incorporate speech, so having like you know diverse representation of that speech is super important. And the Vani project that I mentioned is like you know one attempt to capture that diversity. So yeah, I think we should like not try to capture as much as possible, but these models can also do some generalization beyond that. So, but we should help them with some at least ground level of uh, diversity by capturing that in the data. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And then like, you know, I mean, if you are especially having like uh, speech as output also from these models, so having all of these emotions and expressiveness is super important. Uh, so, uh, are Sadhika. so are LLMs making people's life easy or making people lazy? <laughs> 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 very, very important question. Was that written by LLMs? <laughs> it uh, sounds very poetic. So the thing is, I'm concerned about the learning ability of the people. LLMs make people's easy. I agree with that. With most of the students using ChatGPT, for everything. I'm afraid the coming generations might lose their learning ability on their own. And with the fine tuning, sir mentioned that fine tuning is an educational industry to help students better. Is it like spoon feeding? Because I feel like it is a spoon feeding. So there are two very different points there. One is, is fine tuning like spoon feeding or does fine tuning amount to spoon feeding? That's, a, that's probably a more technical question. And then there's a societal question about the impact of something like you know such language models on uh, the act of teaching and right. right the the practice of pedagogy and all that right so i again these are all very heavily loaded things uh, because uh, so who else so vasu and i are teachers and um, so this semester was very rocky road for me because chat gpt struck our shores 
a couple of weeks into the semester effectively. It was out before the end of the year, but so I trashed all my material and uh, we, I picked up random papers 15 minutes before the lecture. I had no idea what was going to happen. And then we just discussed it organically in the class. I put down some papers, I praised other papers. We discussed what aspects were important, what were not. And uh, I failed to implement this in time for the gone, the semester just gone by, but next semester onwards, we're going to have one unidentified fake student in the class. I have threatened the TAs that there'll be one student. You would not be told who that student is. It'll just be chat GPT or whatever follows it, responses from such an engine to my questions uploaded. And the TAs will have to grade it double blind, not knowing that and then I'll compare it to the rest of the class and see where it stands. Baseline. Yeah, that's an invisible baseline. It will be published after the exam. right? Uh, also, in teaching younger children, I found it useful to, um, you know, when they mess up with like a math word problem, I have found that ChatGPT to be quite useful. It says, show the steps. And then I don't have to show the steps. <laughs> So it's a double-edged sword and um, eventually depends on what people want to learn. I mean, we use calculators. We don't remember a hundred phone numbers of friends and shopkeepers like our parents did. They could really cash a hundred phone numbers in their mind, effortlessly. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. There's a big, uh, the small advertisement. If you're going to be here on 14th this month at around 4.30 in the evening, Please attend the tutorial on what are the generative AI can do to, to education and learning. So the very interesting things that are going to happen, a teaser on that is if you are not interested in learning, LLMs can help you become a little bit more interested in what you are. If you are interested in learning, then actually it will enhance your learning much more easily, you know, with less effort than you know otherwise uh, in, in, in other situations. So my answer to that, your question is, it is actually going to make life easy. At the same time, amount of learning that is going to happen can be more. Look at it very positively. Right, so maybe what we'll do is, uh, there are uh, there are three three people want to raise their hands. So can, you, can I have children in the back, please? Uh, use a LLM in the search engine of a e-commerce website. And say, I, suppose I search for a red bag, and the results are like uh, the results shown are the red colored bags, but I mean red by a brand red. So, how do you pre train the model in this particular case? I would say this may not be the very for that. Well, this is a more general question, but I think this is a more technical question, I guess, which is good, but I think that's not this is a question offline. You can catch them. These are the guys who should, you should bug them, but maybe after the Thing. So, uh, yes, From layman point of view, I would like to uh, one who uh, spoke about the lazy or the easy. Because my son was doing education, and when they have uh, literally asked him to stop handwriting practice, because handwriting in future he is not going to write anything. Then spellings, lot of spelling mistakes were there, but they are not correcting it because the child will be psychologically affected. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do full red mark in the notebook? <laughs> what the reason they are giving is, he need not learn any spellings by heart. Because uh, anyway, uh, if he type H, it will come hello. <laughs> he wants to learn all those things. So literally in rural areas, these are the things we are facing. So, so what is the comment on this? Because we cannot... Uh, <laughs> tell anything because if uh, words and uh, handwriting is like this then sentence I think uh, in future he may not know how to write a sentence also. No, I think it's a very deep point you bring up but probably what we'll do is we'll take the questions together so uh, so can we you know uh, can you get the mic here? Hello um, I'm Deepshika and uh, I work on infectious disease. I uh, first of all excellent talk by all the three speakers. My question is that See, so hierarchy is a human being, then training, then the AI, machines, etc. Now, is it possible that the machine, when you have multiple layers of 
feeding and training, can the machine by themselves cross talk between the different players of the training and become a bit more intelligent due to which what human being brain has not thought of, now the machine is coming up. This is a very nice question because I am not, but is it possible that they do cross talk between the different layers of training? I can take the last question first. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. So Facebook. Uh, okay. So when you say between the layers they cross talk, it could be between two models or within a model. Uh, you know, between the layers. Within a model, it does happen. So when you train, the thing goes forward and backward. So uh, these layers uh, do cross talk to each other, and eventually, what you see is let's say emerge something emerging out of it. Uh, whether they will be, I mean, this question of comparing with human is very, very tricky because language is something like going back to Soman's point, right? Language is very interesting because it's very grounded into our society, our identity. So uh, how we use like the devious use of language and all this. So, uh, so I will give you the Facebook example first, which will probably explain it better. So Facebook tried to do an experiment inspired by Google's AlphaGo. So AlphaGo Zero. So what Google did was to play the game of Go. They made AlphaGo first and which was great. It beat the champions and all. Then they thought instead of training from so much data, I will make two instances of AlphaGo play against each other. It can keep playing millions and millions of games and it will learn. And that was the AlphaGo Zero model. And that also could beat human and very badly, even uh, strongly because uh, it never saw human strategies and its strategies were so alien to humans, humans could not understand anything by looking at the moves and they were lost, um, they, uh, they lost it badly. Facebook inspired by this thought they will make the same chatbot two instances talk to each other and learn from each other and eventually it will become better. And eventually, I think this was 2018, and eventually newspapers carried an article saying, oh, Facebook experiments, uh, you know, uh, took uh, off and uh, chatbots have discovered they invented their own language to talk to each other which humans can't understand because these chatbots were seemingly talking to each other and responding but it was not language human language it was some symbol some uh, garbage and there's a very beautiful philosophical explanation of this which comes from Wittgenstein so he says the game uh, language is like a game but the game of chess, etc., have a fixed rule. In the game of language, the rules evolve as you play the game. So that's why that devious and all that question um, also comes from there. The rule evolves from there. There is a footnote to the AlphaGo story, yes, this comment, yeah. which is by that same token, humans found a weak spot in the model by breaking open the gray model of AlphaGo. There was actually a paper which hardly got any publicity from one of these big three like MIT, Stanford or Berkeley. And they actually designed a strategy and, and a human beat alpha. Yes. So it actually found the divergence between human strategy and the machine strategy and it used that weakness to defeat it. So, uh, so I think uh, I would uh, take this occasion to close this and it's fitting that so many at the last comment. Uh, so, uh, so thanks to the audience and thanks many to the speakers uh, for making time. Uh, clearly, this is a very important issue and I think to Madam's point, I think I would sincerely request if you have time, please attend this, uh, the next uh, conference, Education and Data Mining. See, we need panel discussions on these things. Yeah, so I think please see I do not so I'm not sure which uh, there should be some forum for discussing these things. I think educators of this country have any country have, have to have to come together to ask these kind of questions. On a, on a lighter note, one of my friends was telling me uh, that see calculators came now we could not count. Now chat GPT has come we won't be able to write. But anyway, so thank you, madam, for this opportunity. It was great. It's an honor.